So this CyberQuest Leaders event is really looking to you all for your leadership, your thought leadership, and bringing new ideas to the table. This is all about uh, refreshing the mission and looking at cybersecurity in the DIB. So I don't want to take any time away from our fireside chat. I know you're very excited to hear us all. Uh, thank you so much again. And I'm going to hand this over to Ellen Lord, the Honorable Ellen Lord, who will kick us off and Ms. Stacey Bostjanik. I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Cyber Guild. Can you all hear okay in the back there? All right, excellent. So Stacey and I thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about our backgrounds because obviously that frames our perspective on most things, and we're both pretty interested in the safety and security resiliency of our defense industrial base and cybersecurity plays into that in a significant way. So I think we're gonna start with Stacy, just talking a little bit about her background. I'll talk about my background and then we'll go back and forth. Go ahead, Stacy. Thank you. You guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So I started out in contracting way back in the day at the NSWC White Oak before they blew themselves up. And over the years through contracting, I moved up. I was the head of contracting at DIA before they decided that each one of their seniors needed to rotate and take a joint duty assignment. That's when I ended up going to the Pentagon and getting to work under Miss Lord, which I have to say, with I, Ellen. With Ellen. I don't know that I'll ever get there, ma'am. <laughs> I am so excited today to be on the stage with you because it is such, I've arrived. I am on the stage with Miss Ellen Lord. Can you believe it? Oh, you're easy. You're easy. So, Stacey's had a whole career within the government. Unlike me, I had 33 years in industry working for a conglomerate called Textron, spent 11 years in the automotive industry, and then 22 years in aerospace and defense and very, very unexpectedly came to the Department of Defense as a Senate-approved political appointee in 2017, started out um, as the Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics and had the honor, and in fact, this is why they actually asked me to come in, to bifurcate um, that organization into acquisition and sustainment and research and engineering. So that happened in February of 2018, her and earlier National Defense Authorization Act. So coming into government, I came to realize how no one person can get anything done. Everything's a campaign in Washington. DOD has a lot of authority. However, they have to work with the interagency, or in other words, all the different um, cabinet departments to get things done. I'm now back out as of January 2021 in industry serving on boards and advisories. And I take the security and resiliency of our defense supply chain very, very carefully. So I'm sort of like Ms. outside and Stacy is kind of Ms. inside. <laughs> so I think it would be really interesting, Stacy, if you could share how DOD is working with the different parts of the government to move forward on cybersecurity kind of writ large. And I will just put a disclaimer out here that Stacy cannot talk about CMMC specifically because of some rules that are just about to come out, but I think she can really inform us about the whole process that's gotten yeah, that's to where story. we are. All right. So when we started this whole thing, when I got to meet Katie Arrington in the hallway in 2018 and got brought on to, to help with CMMC, you know, there was a recognition we had had the DFARS Clause 7012 go into effect. Okay, no oh, what was this? So how many of you, so acquisition regulators, <laughs> and it's the, the 252-204-7012 Clause. How many of you are familiar with that clause, right? I expect every hand in the room to go up. So that was the one that said you guys had to meet and be compliant with the standards from NIST to be able to handle controlled unclassified information. There was an IG review, a Navy readiness review that basically said, no, it's not happening, right? So we had the impetus to make sure that the people who are handling our sensitive data 
were complying. So we started doing analysis and assessments to see where we are in the picture. As a result, the uh, it, we were under ANS industrial based policy, and the deputy secretary decided that cybersecurity should be consolidated under the CIO with the cyber geeks. Now, I just told you my background's been in acquisition all my life. I'm just afraid that that was about a three and a half year transition. Yes, you know, starting out in acquisition and sustainment, industrial policy, then moving over to CIO. And yes. 20, yeah, 2021, okay. right? And so it was interesting because, you know, as we went through, we initially with CMMC thought we could do a 48 CFR rule and put it in place. We ended up getting 750 comments against that rule, which drove us to the recognition that we needed to do a full 32 CFR rule, which is what establishes CMMC as a program. So we are full on in that process today. And now that we have moved to the, the CIO and consolidated cybersecurity in their area, I'm the chief of DIB cybersecurity. So it is my responsibility to help work with the DIB through various programs to, to in, implement and uplift the DIB to become cybersecure because it is a huge national security issue. We are losing sensitive data across the nation intellectual property of the individual companies is getting lost. Our sensitive data for our weapon systems and the protection of our, our military members on the ground is getting lost. People's accounts are getting hacked and your payments from the government are getting stolen. And there's nothing that we can do from a, a DOD perspective. If you get your payment from me stolen, I don't have another $100,000 to backfill you and make you whole. DOJ doesn't have the, the bandwidth to go after these people. It's imperative that we as a nation uplift our cybersecurity because we're losing in that war. So I think that brings up a very interesting point. Leadership today in the Pentagon is really committed to this. Um, when the DepSec Def hack Hicks was at CFIS, a think tank prior to coming into this position, she actually led two different studies on gray zone warfare, which is basically everything that happens before things get kinetic. And the reality is that China particularly has been in a gray zone warfare zone with us for quite some time, whether it be attacking our banking infrastructure, critical infrastructure, electrical grids, water, whatever it might be. This really um, took root as it became more and more obvious, not only in Intel briefings, but in open source in 2017, 2018. So DOD looked at what are all the tools we have. We started with entity lists, if you will, that commerce puts out to basically say certain companies cannot supply DOD. Um, we bifurcated the problem of having security um, of our systems and our industrial base by rewriting part of the acquisition system, 5,000, to make sure that our weapon systems were cyber hardened. In other words, um, we did not want hardware calling back to China, sending critical information. We did not want an F-35 all of a sudden to be taken over by nefarious actors as they were executing a mission. So there's a whole side on the hardware and software, but then there was also the side of our defense industrial base and our networks and not allowing so much information to be exfiltrated because we know through all the different organizations, whether they be the intelligence community or whether it be um, some of our other security agencies, that there was a huge outflow. That's what set up uh, the CMMC and a whole series of other tools. I think the challenge is, as we come down to the final rule, it's one thing for a prime or a mid-sized company to deal with this because typically they have the scale to be able to absorb this in their overhead or general and administrative. Um, but for small companies, it's really, really hard when you're looking at making payroll, cash flows critical week to week. 
So what I'd like to talk about a little bit is what each of you can do to make your concerns heard, because this is a challenging journey that DOD is on, and they need input um, from all of you and the organizations they represent. So I think it's important to be part of the community and speak up. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of few very, very different ways to get involved. DOD program managers and program executive officers are trained through the Defense Acquisition University at Fort Belvoir. Jim Wolsey, who runs that organization, is always looking for industry to come in and lecture to the incoming program managers class. So they have one class for first time program managers, and then they have a class for program executive officers who are managers of managers. Although the, there is a lot of government regulation to go through, industry perspectives are very, very important. And why is that? Because the way we all operate is we get laws from Congress, DOD translates those laws into policy and implementation guidance. However, and I experienced this myself, there's this incredible urban legend that grows, like, oh, you can't do that, you need to do that. You say, well, where is that? Well. I can't really show you, but you really should trust me on this. You need to blow away some of those urban legends that are not helpful because I believe we all need to really demonstrate what I would call creative compliance. You have to know enough to get your job done compliantly, but we're not pilots. You do not need to check every single box on the pre-flight gear. You just need to do enough to be creatively compliant. So you need, I would say, to get out there at Defense Acquisition University and talk to these classes of PMs and PEOs about what it's like to be on the industry side, the challenges of small businesses. So that's one thing you can do. Second thing you can do is sort of dare to think and write and get your message out there. And we're very fortunate that our whole defense industrial base ecosystem has a lot of publications that you can contribute to in an editorial way. One of them that I would point out would be the Naval Institute's proceeding. Just about everybody in uniform in the Navy and many civilians read this. It comes out with very thoughtful articles and you can write short, medium or long pieces and get your point of view out there. And the Naval Institute based right on um, the Naval Academy campus in Annapolis is always looking for diversity of thought and input. So if you have issues, if you have ideas, it's another way to communicate and get your message out. Now, if you're a small company, I think you might have noticed if you go and try to get um, an SBIR contract, there are quite a few hurdles to overcome in terms of um, foreign ownership issues and cybersecurity writ large. The whole ecosystem has realized this and the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering, Heidi Shu, has directed her small business office to sponsor a study through the National Academies. It just started. I am one of the people on the committee. And what we're doing is before the whole um, SBIR system, what's the terminology? Yes, Small Business Innovative Research. Right? No, no, what, what they're getting revalidated. Oh, accredited. They're, they're programmed. Well, they're, they're coming up for reevaluation. Yes. Get reaccredited. So in June, we have a report due back to say what's working and what's not working. I love to get real life vignettes because if it's just sort of ideas those are interesting, but they're not always actionable. But if you have vignettes of what's work and wasn't work, that would be really, really helpful. So Stacy has worked a lot on the small business side. Yes. She's got a lot of incoming on that. Yes, ma'am. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so we recognized early on that there was going to be a need for small businesses and medium businesses to get some assistance. So we've set up some different programs. There's Project Spectrum. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. They have consultants that'll come out and sit down with you and help you. Talk about where they're based. Maybe, uh, 
they're in DC. You can um, find. Uh, but they're within industrial. They oh, under, uh, under the Office of Small Business Programs, uh, Farouk Mita is in charge of that program. Uh, if you have any concerns with them, make sure you reach out to us and let us know. But um, also, I'm in charge of the DIBCS program, which is part under the CIO. And that today is available to clear defense contractors. But come April, when another rule that I'm working on hopefully goes final, it'll be open to any defense industrial base partner that handles controlled unclassified information. Are we taking questions? Go ahead. The Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Program. So, okay, so we're going to put you on the spot, Stacy. What is your email address? All of these people hear this, but they might not know how to get a hold of you. Info, wait, no. What, what, this is a multi-step process. <laughs> okay, right. Step one, uh, so, spell out your in, email. email. Are you guys ready? Stacy, S T A C Y dot S as in Sam, Bosch, yeah, <laughs> dot Bosch Janik, B O S. T J A N I C K dot C I V at mail dot mil. All right, do it one more time. All right, Stacy S T A C Y dot S dot Boss Janik B O S T J A N I C K dot C I V at mail dot mil. You know, Boss Janik, I married that name. It was Shank. It was a lot easier before I married that. It felt just like it sounded. That's right. <laughs> so, I think one of the important things here is DOD often is very opaque, and you need a human being to reach out to. And Stacy has a team that she can vector right. a lot of this information. Yes, sir. and we do have, if you go to the CIO website, there are there's a, a place that you can put your questions in that'll go to the team to be able to be answered. We often put the um, answers out on the acquisition toolbox. And so there are a lot of different capabilities today to help companies become uh, cyber secure. Right, the DIBCS program, ha once you're a member of that, has a team that will go through a checklist and sit down with you, talk through you, talk you through the 171, help you decide where you are in your maturity and your cybersecurity. The um, NSA Cyber Collaboration Center is always looking for partners to come up and work with them. They have security agency, yep. And they have um, a secure domain name uh, program that they help companies with. So, you know, take it. Uh, the cyber collaboration system. I do not, center. I do not know the name of the de security. Oh, went on the NSA website. Can you get? To yes, it? yes, you can. And yeah, I think you told me previously that they're actually looking for more companies to engage. Yes, yes. had the level of engagement that's they'd right. like to see. That's so right. That's, that's a huge opportunity. That's yes, it is. Government at work for you. Yeah. Okay, so one. I think we've painted the picture of why this all matters the multi-step process where DOD has to work with the Office of Management and Budget, OIRA, yes. uh, the Office of yes. whatever that is. What is it? Office of uh, uh, the OIRA. You, you want to yeah. Office of, it's regulatory something. Okay. <laughs> Information and regulatory. And, so uh, there's that's ones that make the rules. So in other words, DOD just doesn't make this stuff up. It's a game back and forth, back and forth, back and right. forth. Yes. In conjunction with Congress continuing to put all sorts of provisions like Buy America and other things. Right, right. So it's a campaign to get yeah. all this done. One of the challenges I know that we saw back in 2017 and 2018 was having a cyber ready workforce. Yes. And just locally, University of Maryland, as I recall, has quite a large yes, program. I do. What are you hearing back from industry and what do you see within DOD about finding people skilled in the art of cybersecurity? So there's a deficit and um, we've done a couple of studies. I think one of the first studies said that companies that make a, have a million dollars in revenue and above are better put, postured for cybersecurity than those below. We found through a study that there is a deficit of cybersecurity professionals out there. It's very hard for companies to afford a full-time FTE in cybersecurity and full, I'm sorry, full-time equivalent uh, person to participate in their companies for cybersecurity. So, you know, we're trying to promote the cyber workforce. 
trying to get the young people of today involved in cybersecurity. It's a burgeoning field. It's something that, uh, you know, a lot of universities are starting to get on top of and work with uh, students to become that. It would be a great field to get into because there's not a lot of competition for the jobs today. But our, our smalls and mediums are struggling to get that uh, expertise in their fields, in their uh, companies. So I think we've provided a number of touch points within DOD as well as the intelligence community for you to tap into, to get more information, to get support. I think um, we've also made the point that communication kind of writ large is so important. And you can reach out, you can speak to those up and coming individuals within DOD if you work with the Defense Acquisition University and talk about a target rich audience. Right. You know, everybody there has to implement this. You can write and contribute to proceedings with the Naval Institute. Um, they're always looking for things. And you can work with a whole variety of small businesses. That's right. So with that, with a few minutes left, I think what we're going to do is open it up for just general questions. I'll make one more comment. The rule should drop this month. It is your opportunity for 60 days to make public comments. Please read it. Please make comments. We embrace those. We want to know your opinions. The one thing I want to say, though, is the standard is the standard. We, we recognize through your original comments that the 171 was we back to CMMC back to simplify it, to make it easier for you. And so we're not going to be able to relitigate the application of the standards for CUI, but how our program is established is what you're going to see in there. Classified aid information. I'm terrible. I've been in the building too long. I did. <laughs> so from that perspective, give us your feedback. We genuinely are wanting to hear from you. We want to see, but if you have a criticism, please give us an opportunity to hear your perspective on how it should go. And I'll just say, I think it's incredibly important to have these forums that bring together government and industry, because when you're sitting in the government seat, you're limited as to what you can do to convene. And it's <laughs> really, really important to use these nonprofit groups to convene people. Um, to get the questions kicked off, and I'll have a roaming mic, uh, would you speak to the international landscape, both what are we seeing, what are we learning, what are they doing that we're not doing, or vice versa? Okay, so when we came up with this need for cybersecurity and assessments, we've had several interactions with our partners. Some countries are concerned about assessments happening on their soil. So we've engaged in a crosswalk between the NIST 800-171 and the cyber standards that are in place in their country. Stacy's vision is that we're going to come together. We've had one nation, the UK, has come to the US. They have observed two assessments that have happened on our soil. We're, they have updated their standard, and it's going to look very much like the NIST 800-171. And so here in the spring, we will go to the UK, and we will uh, view and observe them performing an assessment there. From there, we intend to come up with a common assessment framework, because it's not realistic to think that every one of our standards is going to match to theirs. But what I can say is when you go in to do that assessment, since you guys don't do it the way we do, but you understand now how we do it, can you look at it for me? Because one of the other things that I've heard from industry a lot is that because each nation that they work with now has a, a concern about cybersecurity, a lot of these companies are getting assessed constantly by each nation coming in. And we also have our, our friends that have come together, the BRICS, that's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, Saudi Arabia and China, right? And so they have a group that comes in and does an assessment, and we are not sure where those assessment reports go, right? Companies have had their assessors come in and their reports written, and so, you know, ostensibly you're giving them the keys to your kingdom when they come in and, and evaluate your, your network. So we want to have it so where we have reciprocity 
so that when we do an assessment in the U.S., it can be recognized globally and we can stop this constant state of assessment and we can make sure that we have our data and our information uh, secure here. So two points to build on what Stacy said. One, we often have some cultural challenges with some of our allies and partners. For instance, in Japan, who has boosted their defense spending tremendously in the last year or two, but we had very close partnerships with, we always have this challenge with them in that they do not handle security the same way we do. So in other words, they do not have individual security clearances um, at the different levels we do because it's very much opposed to Japanese culture. Yeah, someone knock on your door um, or on your neighbor's doors and say, did you see anything weird at Stacy's house? Or what do you think about for as a person? All the kinds of things we do to get our clearances. That means that when the U.S. works with Japan on programs, we have to go program by program to get all the clearances. This is just kind of echoed and amplified when we're talking about, you know, the defense industrial base. So we've got to continue to chip away at that. Now, on the flip side, we also realize with like-minded allies and partners, it's simpler, faster to use economies of scales with organizations. So um, many of our partners and allies belong to NATO. So the U.S. works under the NATO umbrella quite a bit to get things done. Now, Bill LaPlante, current Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, every six months goes to Brussels to meet with NATO partners. And the U.S., he's our National Armaments Director. That's the hat he works. He goes to the Council of National Armaments Directors. He does what are called in NATO speak, because everybody has to have their own lexicon, he does interventions to raise ideas and lead. One of the things he could do more interventions on is um, the cybersecurity of our defense industrial base. So there's another opportunity to add to your um, job list there. All right, we have a question. Hi, ladies, thank you for being here today. Julie Vita with Mantech. Uh, um, my question is about the cybersecurity workforce. And you mentioned reports, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, research and reports about the lack of cybersecurity talent. I think that's um, well understood and we all struggle with that, whether you're government or industry and getting the right talent. My question is, is the government considering anything new in terms of incentive programs or job sharing or um, new ways of recruiting and retaining talent in the government? Yeah, you know, we all know that compensation is an issue or we know that security clearances can be an issue. What is the government doing to shake it up a little bit and make things easier for people to work for the government in the cybersecurity um, discipline? So we've established the cyber um, uh, accepted service is what they're calling it, right? And it, there's a whole new uh, area you can direct. It's a new career field. You can direct hire. It's got different direct hire. Excuse me. If this is a very important um, authority to have, it means you don't have to go through that six month process to get somebody on board. Right. And so if we can identify an individual that has the resident capability and expertise. We can bring them right in. The um, pay scale can be uh, a little bit higher than normal because we recognize this is a huge issue. I think, you know, one of the other areas that we're looking at is trying to help people do time in industry, right? You can have, have an industry program. exchange program so that, that we can help infuse that capability in industry and also get those perspectives back and forth. So what all of you can do to help Stacy have these authorities and more is talk to the interested committees on the Hill. So um, the Senate Armed Services Committee, the authorizers, they're the ones that usually write the language that goes into the annual National Defense um, whatever act. Authorization act. Act, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> um, and they write in these authorities. So you can go and echo and amplify everything that Stacy just said, saying we've got a deficit of people. We need um, trained cyber people, not only in industry, but very much so in government. So these authorities are important to get that done. Yes, very much so. 
Hi, I'm Tom Suter with ATARC. I'm one of those nonprofits you were talking about. Uh, a question I have is we have all these programs that have rolled out historically. What are, what, what are you going to do on automation? We're not going to be building cybersecurity people that fast, right? We need to, right. tools can you provide to small businesses to help them automate some of the security compliant? So, you know, in, as federal government, it's very hard for us to be able to say, you need to go use ABC tool. Right now, what we have done is we've worked very closely with the different cloud service providers and said, you need to help us. Right. We need to be able to build something that is affordable, that gets small and medium companies compliant in an easy uh, fashion. In fact, we had dinner one night and they said, you know, Stacy, what do you think is affordable? And of course, I was like, I don't know, $50 a seat license and they fell on the floor, you know, and said, come on, be reasonable. But, you know, something that a comp that's not going to bankrupt a small company, keep them in the game and allow them to be secure. We have been fortunate. We've seen a lot of small companies come up and build tools, right? I can't go out and assess them and go, oh, this is the best one because then I would be driving the market, right? So that's not to me. Yes. And so, you know, I think from, from our perspective, we're so thankful and so embracing of the companies that are trying to help. And there are a bunch of them out there. Yeah, one of the things you might want to consider is to go to a group like um, National Defense Industrial Association, NDIA, and say, this is a problem. Could you convene government, large and small companies to talk about this? and share a potential yep. solution. Yep. Because I think the industry associations have the ability and the gravitas to do that and drive it so that you have some actionable result out there. Right. Right. And I would say, you know, um, if you are subbing to a large prime, that should be part of your negotiation to help them help you with some of this because they are investing in the licenses to use AI, ML to really illuminate the supply chain, they have the ability through their scale to do that. Um, they know, the primes know that about 90% of the innovation comes from the small. So it's kind of a quid pro quo here. You could love yeah. that as well. Hey, Stacey, Ms. Lord, appreciate you guys. Um, Steve from IntelliGRC, um, I've been asking this to different you know, leaders in the space and I can't get an answer. And I was hoping maybe from an acquisition perspective, I could maybe get one. I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire, but it's a question that I've had. We've been talking about like through the JSVA program about assessing the 800-171, the Joint Surveillance Voluntary Assessment Program. Okay. Sorry, I'm just as bad as you, Stacey. Um, but so we've undergone that. We've seen how that works. And as a precursor to hopefully what's going to be laid out in the ruling rulemaking, but one of the things that I haven't seen and I've had questions about is not only the assessment of those requirements, but the assessment of the other DFAR 7012 requirements, the C through G, about the cyber, like testing the capabilities to do that and verifying that you are ready to do that if an incident were to happen or something like that. But more importantly, laying out a more um, descriptive and an honest answer from the DOD about the 7010 requirements about cloud computing services and relating back to the Federant Plus requirements and, you know, all those RMF related things. And I, I have had people freak out because they went and read the 7010 requirements and they're like, the CO never told me about this. And we might have a tool that we're providing as part of the contract that is cloud service based. So I was just hoping, could I maybe get some details about that? from an acquisition perspective, perspective, when that applies, about DFAR 7010, cloud computing, Federant Plus, all those different things. Okay, so in your contracts, right, you're going to have those clauses that are going to be there, and you'll have to comply with them. Now, in the 7012 clause from a cloud perspective today, it says you must be FedRAMP moderate equivalent. We worked to have a memo put together that should be, I feel like uh, my program office is the Christmas present to industry, right? Because it should be coming out sometime soon that outlines what our expectation is of FedRAMP moderate equivalency. 
there, right? Because, you know, companies that don't currently have federal work can't get a FedRAMP, uh, you know, formal FedRAMP approval. So what does that mean for companies that are trying to assist in this space to get us there? So we, we put together that memo. You know, a lot of this stuff is, it's kind of, I can't say because it's in the rule. It's killing me, but, you know, I, I have to wait, right? Hi, Stacy. So my, my name is Amrit. I'm with Intersex Small Business. And Can you speak I, up a little louder, sir? I'm sorry. Yeah. So my name is Amrit. I'm with Intersex and a small business. I want to touch upon the cyber workforce development. We have failed. I mean, yes, we have been failing the traditional cyber workforce development, right? The training methods or whatever. There has been a nice, it's like at the end of the day, even if we train, and those are being pushed by the commercial and private sector. They are gone to the commercial and private sector. The traditional programs are failing. How are we going to address this uh, from the perspective of coaching and mentoring? At the end of the day, no one is going to be just like, okay, uh, entertain a cyber, work, cyber workforce uh, out of the college. They got to be trained and they got to be coached and mentored, right? Boots on the ground. And they don't even like, okay, they know the acronyms. How are we going to address this space unless we coach and mentor? That's the only way. We got to just hire the people and coach and mentor. That's the only way we can get them into the defense industrial base. Uh, so what is your take on it? I 100% I agree. Uh, especially you've got to consider that I'm an acquisition person that's just been thrown into CIO. Right, so I am grappling to learn uh, everything about IT and the systems and the networks. And I think that's where the ideas about the exchange programs and bringing people in for the cyber accepted service and, and giving them a little bit of an upper to get them in and, and, and get their boots on the ground. Because I think, you know, the thing that I've learned the most since I've been in CIO, right, sitting with the professionals, I like to call them lovingly the geeks, right? Because they know, but they learned it from boots on the ground. Everybody's network is a little bit different. When you listen to uh, John Ellis from DCMA, right? They've gone out and they've done assessments and they've had people pass with 110 and they spent $5,000 because of the way they set their network up, right? So you've got to have hands-on experience, I think, to, to truly understand how things go together, right? You got to plug the wrong thing in and have, oh, everything went down. What what did I do wrong? And so and, until we have that practical knowledge, it's going to be very difficult. And this is one of the challenges, right? But we as a nation are very innovative, smart people, right? We've been founded on changing and building and moving into new directions. That's why we're one of the leaders of the world. We can figure this out. We just have to come together and do it. So is DOD putting any type of primer together, so to speak, anything like that? Or do you see any trade associations or any private companies doing that? So um, I know NDIA was talking about putting together playbooks for small companies to how to become cyber secure and working with industry on best practices. We routinely interact with those uh, groups to ask for their assistance. You know, we have authorities that we're bound by that, that limit us for how much we can get involved in your business, right? And you want that. You don't want us to be in there directing or telling you how to do things. So we have to definitively be that partnership. And I believe that that's another area that we can grow and build the DIBCS program to help, right? But we need your input. We need the, th the smart, innovative people to come to us and help us do that. I have, I have a question. Uh, good morning. I'm with Fairfax County Economic Development, Asher Courts. Uh, I think it's, uh, we're ripe for that, right? There's a lot of people retiring from the military, and they are perfect to help us. They understand the space. They understand the importance of the mission. And, you know, a lot of them are struggling once they retire to find their next career. And most of them need to find a next career. So they are a ripe target of opportunity. Thank you, guys. So thank you very much. That was all the questions. I just want to say 
Um, our luminary, the Honourable Ellen Lord. Thank you so much, Ellen. Always supports the Cyber Guild. And Stacey, you're so welcome to the community. Thank you for making this happen. Oh, Round of applause, you. please.